Amori's core plot revolves around the division between Sunny's dreams and reality, also known as Headspace and the real world, in which the former contains the largely superficial turn-based combat elements, but not much that adds to the overall story, while the latter contains very little combat, basically only against the hooligans and some bugs, but encompasses the entire story element of the game. It's an interesting split between gameplay and story, but what I find most interesting is the parallels between Headspace and the real world. Sunny, of course, lives in the real world, but it's fairly easy to see how he drew inspiration for certain aspects of his dreams from his reality. So let's talk about them. I'll be dedicating this video to talking about every aspect of Headspace which was inspired by something in Faraway Town, or the game universe in general. I'll be talking about the aspects in order in which you would encounter them in a regular playthrough. Please note, no matter how much I try to be the epic lore master of Amori stuff, I will probably miss some stuff. If so, please tell me in the comments. Also, this video will not be discussing foreshadowing elements unless they are related to this video. Maybe that's a subject for another one. Also, I will not be talking about real life references in dreams. Sure, Download Window is a funny joke about Internet Explorer, and Life Jam Guy is a rip-off Kool-Aid man, but I won't be talking about them here since they are real life references, not real world ones. This video will also contain a ton of speculation on my part because I may have to theorise as to what different Headspace characters represent. With all that being said, let's get going. Also, like and subscribe, it's a good idea. The beginning of the game is already quite telling. Amori finds himself in white space, and oh look, Amori is actually based on Sunny, who is a Hikiko Mori. Get it? Alright, jokes aside, there is still some stuff to talk about here. Miyo is obviously inspired by Mari's real life cat, who Sunny was oddly attached to. The laptop may be a loose representation of Mari and Sunny's home computer, seeing as one of the few things you can do on them is play a simple video game. After finding the knife and going through the door, Amori finds himself in the neighbor's room, where he meets Kel, Aubrey, and Hiro, who were inspired by... themselves, obviously. They are playing cards, just as they all used to in their old treehouse. In fact, the whole neighbor's room itself is a representation of the old treehouse in Sunny and Mari's backyard, fit with a TV, sweetheart mask, baseball and bat, clock, toaster, potted plant, and even the big yellow cat seen on the calendar. There is also, oddly enough, a photo of someone familiar on the upper table. The photo is accompanied by two candles, one on each side of it. We see a similar arrangement of photos and candles later in the game, where people appear to be paying respect to loved ones who've passed away. Combined with a potential scare seen later in the game, I think we can determine who this familiar someone is. An even stranger occurrence is that the jump rope found in the treehouse is not present in the neighbor's room, and I wonder why Sunny decided to repress that memory. The room is much larger than the treehouse, which could be Sunny's perception of the treehouse as much bigger than it actually was, due to being much younger and smaller back then. Eleanor will fight as they normally do in the real world, but their fights are more mean-hearted and more often in headspace. Leaving the room, Amori is given an allowance by a snake, and I genuinely am unsure what the heck the snake is supposed to represent. It could be a metaphor for Sonny's parents with how they give allowance, and how he might subconsciously view his parents as cunning and manipulative, possibly helping to cover up the manslaughter of his sister, but that doesn't make sense since we see the snake falling off the otherworld ladder in a comedic manner later in the game, so I don't think this is a deep metaphor in any way. We find out that the neighbor's room is a tree stump, which is an incredibly obvious allusion to the tree that Mari was hanged on, which was subsequently chopped down by her father. Going down to the playground, the party meets Basil and Mari, inspired by... Basil and Mari, in case you didn't realise. They are sitting at a picnic, which also acts as a save point. This is of course a reference to Mari's love of picnics. Looking through Basil's photo album, we can see that the photos, for the most part, are near identical to the ones found in the real world, save for a few minor changes, such as Kel drinking milk instead of Orange Joe, and some photos which are completely absent. It is also established here that Mari and Hiro have something going on between them, which is an obvious parallel to their real world, wanting to date but dad won't allow it so let's pretend it's platonic relationship. Anyway, I'll whip through some random NPCs. Okay, so, 
Burly is based on Kim, since they both have the same hairstyle and gruff personality, as well as the fact that their names combined becomes Kimberly. Van is based on Vance, being a really big boy who really likes candy and does whatever Burly slash Kim says. Charlene is based on Charlene, or Charlie, since they are both really tall and shy with wavy hair over their eyes. Mikal is based on Mikhail, aka the Maverick, since they both have the same hair and are both pretty full of themselves. I also like to think Sunny deliberately imagined Mikal to be a monkey, because of his real-world counterpart's tendency to make a fool out of himself. Neb is based on Angel because they look similar. Nose, bun, bangs, happy, and brows are all inspired by Sunny's plush toys, but I've seen an argument that happy is also based on joy, though I personally think the only connection is the names being similar. Ren is based on Karen, due to similarities in appearance, and they both have a relationship with another NPC named Sean in both Headspace and the real world. The mailbox is based on a mailbox which can be seen outside other Mart in the real world. After a game of hide and seek which spirals into a hostage situation involving Basil, the party must now fight against the first enemy, a big rhinoceros looking bully named Boss. Now I'm not sure what Boss was inspired by, but I think this is Sunny's warped perception of what a bully might look and act like. I mean, this kid hasn't interacted with any human besides his parents for the last four years. Another interesting thing is that Boss's most notable colour is pink, much like the most prominent colour featured on another certain bully. But speaking of hair, you should have noticed by now that all of the main characters except for Amori and Basil have purple hair which was the colour Mari wanted to dye her hair in the real world, which never happened for obvious reasons. Basil and the party venture into the vast forest, which may be a representation of the forest behind Faraway Park, or possibly even just Sunny's backyard. The emotions chart given to Amori by Hiro is actually a neat bit of foreshadowing and reference to the real world. Each member of the group reacted differently to Mari's death. Sunny, or Amori, chose to repress all memories and emotions, becoming completely neutral. Kel, upset that his old friend group had fallen apart, chose to make new friends to maintain some happiness in his life. Hiro, thinking he could have saved Mari from the apparent suicide, went into a depressive state and shut himself away from the rest of the world. And Aubrey, thinking no one was taking Mari's death as seriously as she was, became an aggressive thug and hung out with the wrong crowd. What is quite interesting is that Basil is not present in the emotion chart. My interpretation of this is that his absence was deliberate, because in the real world, Basil felt afraid and traumatised due to his role in framing Mari's death. And I don't think Hiro would have wanted to put a negative emotion like that on a tutorial chart, so it's omitted. Sprout Moles are the tutorial enemies, which were inspired by an arcade game called Sprout Mole Eater. It's implied that Sunny doesn't like Sprout Moles, based on the fact that they enjoy tofu and headspace, which is another thing Sunny dislikes, as well as the faux facts entry of them being quite negative. On the way to Basil's house, Basil stops frequently to describe flowers, linking each type to a certain character based on their personality. This is actually inspired, as the friends grew these flowers in the real world, as evidenced by these images in the final duet scene. After the first scare, Amori is teleported back to white space and is forced to stab himself. I hope this stabbing isn't indicative of anything Sunny experiences in the real world. After waking up, fighting off fears, eating steak and going back to sleep, Amori ventures through headspace in search of the now missing Basil. Pinwheel Forest is a newly accessible area, which is inspired by the weird emphasis on pinwheels as a motif in the real world. Here we get introduced to Hector, Kel's pet rock. This is a very interesting parallel, since in the real world Hector is Kel and Hero's dog, and Pet Rocks is a Tamagotchi style rock paper scissors game. The party can also meet the Kite Kid in Pinwheel Forest who was inspired by a book Sunny read as a child called A Kid and His Kite. Before ascending the ladder to Otherworld, a side quest for Burly can be done, which, if completed, rewards Aubrey the headbutt skill. It may be small, but this is already an indicator that Burly, aka Real World Kim, has a connection to Aubrey which she does not have with any other party member. Once reaching Otherworld, you can fight a mini-boss called Pluto, who is based on Kel's character in the Pet Rocks game. Interestingly enough, Pluto takes special interest in Kel, which makes sense since Kel is technically his owner in the real world. A few NPCs also have some parallels. Jock Jams is an NPC you can find on the Otherworld outskirts. On his boombox, you can play the song Yo DJ Pump This Party, which can also be played on the boombox in Kel and Hero's bedroom. 
Percy is a massive sweetheart fan, and his house is quite literally a massive sweetheart mask. One of the veggie kids in Raintown bears a striking resemblance to Aubrey's plush toy Mr. Plantic. All of the other veggie kid NPCs seem to have a similar character design, implying that there may also be other vegetable based plush toys in the real world. Furthermore, the veggie kid with the tomato head is based on the Pet Rocks character named Tomato Girl, owned by this girl in hobbies. After talking to a depressed space boy, the party must venture into the junkyard to find a lost mixtape. The entire junkyard area might be a loose reference to the Recycultist hideout, which are both areas based entirely around garbage, as well as being the areas where you are introduced to the tagging mechanic in both the real world and headspace. Taking the mixtape back to the sad boy, he angrily wakes up to it being played and engages in the first major boss fight. Space Boy is based on a comic book series. Interestingly enough, his frequent name changing is also inspired by the comics. His battle theme, which I must say is really good, is inspired by an arcade game called Captain Space Boy's Space Adventure. I think I'll also note here that every bunny enemy in the game is also drawn from the Space Boy comics. To progress the game, Amori ventures alone through cattail fields, following Stranger to a mysterious barn. Of course, Stranger is based on Basil and was manifested as a physical embodiment of seeking the truth. But what I actually want to talk about is the contents of the barn. Inside is a family painting, which looks oddly similar to Sunny and Mari's family photo. There is also a music stand holding sheet music which is an allusion to the recital Mari and Sunny were going to perform in the real world. Something chases Amori, jump scare, back to white space, stabby stab, and then wake up. Real world things happen, Sunny fights a big metaphorical spider then goes back to sleep. The most prominent immediate change here is Aubrey's relationship with Amori. She's just madly in love with him now. This is because of Sunny's real world crush on Aubrey, however he wasn't sure if she liked him back. So in Headspace, he imagines that Aubrey has a crush on him, or at least his stand-in, Amori. Into Pyrefly Forest, Hiro's arachnophobia is made immediately apparent, as he gets scared of even entering the area, as well as starting every fight against the spider-like enemies with the afraid emotion. This parallels the real world, in which he is also scared of bugs and spiders. Random Theory Sunny might have a fear of teddy bears, evidenced by the existence of rare bears, which pretend to be innocent looking creatures before angrily engaging in a battle when approached. Sunny also doesn't seem to have any teddy bears despite owning a lot of plush toys. When approaching Sweetheart's castle, the party is ambushed by an abomination called King Crawler, who was not only inspired by the Sprout Mole Eater arcade game, it was the playable character, moving around and eating Sprout Moles in a snake-like style. After the fight, the party enters Sprout Mole Village, there's nothing much here since most of the denizens are just sprout moles. There are a few things though. There's a secret invention known as the BED being developed by the mayor, which is very obviously inspired by Sunny's very strange obsession with beds and sleeping. Entering the castle, the party gets to watch Sweetheart's Quest for Hearts, which is basically just every dating show in existence. Sweetheart herself is based on a movie character, but her loud and overbearing personality may have been inspired by the candy shop owner Miss Candace, who also has some visual similarities. After being thrown into the dungeon, the party must escape and make their way back to the main level of the castle. This is the one instance I could find of Headspace offering lore that the real world never mentions. Kel does not like pickles. Never in the real world is this acknowledged, this is game breaking. Anyway, after fleeing the dungeon, the party can find Rococo hidden in the walls. He is an artist named after a French art style, which was known for its classical and ornamental appearance and theatrical presentation. Oddly enough, Rococo never paints in a Rococo style. He may also be based on the artist NPC in the real world, as they are both aspiring painters who gradually improve at their craft the more they are spoken to by Amori or Sunny. Sweetheart later attempts to marry herself, which is quite funny when it happens, but when you think about it, it seems really sad that she thinks she's the only person who loves her. Here's a bit of speculation. 
This could be a metaphor for Sunny's loneliness, having no one to give affection to, so in a way, Sweetheart trying to marry herself might be an allegory for Sunny or Amori, being so isolated from everyone else that he is the only person that he can love. After beating Sweetheart in a battle, the party, or Amori rather, can venture into the Lost Library, a dark and mysterious library filled with books of Sunny's memories. Here, Amori can read through six of Sunny's memories. The construction of the treehouse, Kel spilling juice on the carpet, a car ride, daydreaming at school, almost drowning at the lake hangout spot, and his thoughts on playing the violin. In a way, the Lost Library is a place which stores all of Sunny's repressed memories, as evidenced by the black space-esque vibe given by the presence of somethings in the room. In the next Headspace segment, all of Sunny's friends are gone, having been tricked into signing contracts by Mr. Jawson. The casino they now work at, The Last Resort, is inspired by the blackjack game on Sunny and Mari's computer, which was ocean-themed in aesthetic. Throughout this area, you can also find some adult-only fruit juice, which is a funny way of saying alcohol. Not much else in The Last Resort parallels the real world, so let's move on. After freeing themselves from Jawsome's control, the party finds Sweetheart on her way to Deeper Well and decides to follow her. Here in Deeper Well, the party encounters an assortment of nonsensical and surreal NPCs. They mostly spout philosophical nonsense about the dreamer and the existence of headspace, but there is one particular character named Cypher who simply says, The sun shined brighter when she was here. Not only is this dialogue not related to Headspace whatsoever, it is also the text which was inscribed on Mari's gravestone. It's a really interesting detail. The branch coral reveals some cool lore and exposition, but it doesn't have anything noteworthy regarding parallels to the real world. The party then meets the big lovable whale named Humphrey. Humphrey is based on a book Sunny read as a child named Hungry Humphrey, which explains his status as the oldest being and his near parasitic desire for food. Like, I'm not kidding. The branch coral refers to Humphrey as a parasite. Anyway, nothing much is noteworthy inside of Humphrey, except for Chimera, a horrific monster in Marina's lab, which is based on this keychain you can collect in the real world. Eventually the party must fight the slime girls. I don't know what the slime girls are based on. I've seen a lot of theories that they were inspired by the stuff that Amori Boy watched in the original comics by Omicat. This could be true, seeing as the strange fight intro actively sexualizes the characters in a way. Ooh, hey, who's that one? Oh, who? Who's that one? Ooh, hey! Oh, who that? Oh! Alright! After the fight, Humphrey, who I must remind you, is a hungry boy, decides to devour everything inside him, engaging in a fight with the party. This fight is discomforting and very fitting of a psychological horror game, but also serves as a sort of symbolism of Sunny's mental state. But that's not related to this video, so let's move on. After getting spat out by Humphrey, the party collects the final key, and Amori can then venture into black space. But we're not talking about that in this video. Orange Oasis is a location I have not yet talked about, so here are some inspirations. The Unbred Twins, Doe and Biscuit, are based on the Maverick's real-world older siblings, Daphne and Bowen, who are the children of the Bakers in Other Mark. It is revealed that the Maverick is eventually going to inherit the bakery, which he is not very happy about. There is an interesting theory that Sonny took the Maverick's disdain for his bread-making family, and instilled that personality trait into the Unbred Twins. The result? Two depressed siblings who hate making bread but think it's their only purpose in life. Orange Joe is an NPC who is based on the drink Orange Joe, which also happens to be Kel's favourite drink. Papa Chip is an oven man you can find in Brevin. He is obviously inspired by Papa Chip, a real world chef who has written many recipe books, one of which is bought by Kel and Sunny and given to Hiro. His design is inspired by Daphne's Pet Rocks character. Chicken and Rabbit in Dino's Dig are both photorealistic still images of a chicken and a rabbit, respectively. Animals such as flies and wasps are also photorealistic in battles in Faraway Town. There are a couple of things I didn't know where to mention in the video, so I'll list them here. 
the emphasis on watermelons throughout Headspace is Sonny being sentimental about eating watermelons with his friends. Each party member fights with a specific type of weapon. Amori uses a knife, which he can't change until finding the red knife. Kill uses balls, and his final weapon is a basketball, which is his favourite sport in the real world, and his weapon of choice there as well. Hiro uses cooking tools, such as frying pans and blenders, with his last weapon being an upgraded version of his default spatula, called Old Reliable. And Aubrey uses weapons you can bludgeon people with, such as plush toys and body pillows, with a final weapon being a baseball bat, a very obvious allusion to Earthbound's Ness. And finally, every Jash is just a reference to the Rock Paper Scissors game, in which Jash is Sunny's playable character. If you liked the video, be sure to like and subscribe. I probably missed a couple of references, so please let me know in the comments. I'll probably make a pinned comment listing the stuff I didn't mention. If you were kind enough to watch to the end of the video, you should also be kind enough to join my Discord server. Link is in the description. This video is already long enough. It was meant to be a filler video for goodness sake, though I think I'll end it here. See you next video.